Have you ever started to eat a bag of chips? And you get down to about an eighth of the bag of chips left. And you think to yourself, well, I've gone this far. I should probably just eat the rest of the bag of chips. I have done that far too many times. It seems like there's not a simple way for me to, as I'm eating a bag of chips, realize you've had enough chips, Micah. Now's the time to stop. So I figured out that if you portion for yourself a little bit of chips beforehand, take it out of the bag and then leave the bag alone, you do much better. You only eat the portion and you've made a commitment to yourself. I'm only going to eat the portion so you don't go back and eat the rest from the bag. My sense is I'm not the only person who suffers from this mistake, if you will, of eating the whole bag of chips accidentally when you have the whole bag in your hands. It's hard for us, actually, to say no, to recognize when we've had enough. As human beings, it's not a simple thing for us to say no, to restrict ourselves, to limit ourselves. As we pay attention to this text this morning, from Matthew chapter 3 and 4, we're going to hear about Jesus and his decision to say no to bread. Let me pray as we enter into this text and we listen to hear what does God have to say to us through this word. Father Almighty, we ask that through your word, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would illumine our minds, rekindle our hearts, and strengthen our wills, O oh Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Throughout the season of Lent, from Ash Wednesday until Easter, we are reading from this story from Jesus' baptism and his testing in the wilderness. And we're going to read the same text five times. We're going to come at this text five times. And the goal is to really pay attention to this story. Throughout Lent, Lent is the season from Ash Wednesday to Easter in which the church has historically found that we need to make space in our own lives, make room for us to pay attention to Jesus and what he has to say to us as mortals, as those who need a Messiah and a Savior, and as we prepare ourselves for Easter, for Jesus to be crucified, to remember his crucifixion, and for him to Easter us once more on Easter Sunday. Come, Lord Jesus. So as we pay attention to this text, that's what we're doing. We're trying to prepare ourselves to hear again the good news of Easter. And the story that was read this morning is a holy story, a sacred story. There is no other story like it in the Bible. There was no eyewitnesses there. This isn't somebody who was at the wilderness with Jesus and saw what was happening and took good notes. There was nobody out in the wilderness with Jesus. This story comes to us right from Jesus' journal. Therefore, it is a sacred and special story. As we listen to this story, as we pay attention to it, it should sound and feel like freedom. It should not be oppressive guilt. What's happening here is Jesus is revealing to us something about what it means to be human, something about what it means in existence in our life that we have right now. And it's not meant to press in on us and make us feel incredibly guiltful. It should be good news. It is serious work. It is a serious story. Jesus is telling us, wake up, you have an enemy. But it shouldn't feel like a scary, oh, woe is me, shame upon you. It should feel like, oh, we do have an enemy, and now I know the enemy's secrets. Because Jesus is giving us the playbook of the enemy. And what's happening is Jesus, in this story, is revealing to us two voices. The first voice is the voice of his father that he hears at his baptism. His father says to him, you are my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And then Jesus goes into the wilderness, directed there by the Holy Spirit to go into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he hears the second voice, the second voice that says, if you are the Son of God. The Spirit of God directed Jesus into the wilderness for a test, 
to be tested in the wilderness. This test is meant to prove and to improve a person's faith. It's meant to prove and improve, not because God doesn't know whether or not someone has faith, but to prove and improve their faith before others. So that's what is happening. You're going into the wilderness. Jesus goes into the wilderness to be proven and to be improved in terms of his relationship, his identity as the Son of God, as spoken at his baptism, and as the suffering servant, also referenced at his baptism. So Jesus goes into the wilderness, and he's going to be tested. Jesus, will you, even if there are no signs that you are the beloved Son, will you believe that you are the beloved Son? And Jesus, will you take the route of the suffering servant on your mission, even if it looks like that mission will not be a success in that way? Jesus reveals to us that what happens to us in the wilderness is a mental battle. He's revealing to us that as human beings, we participate in this mental battle. And my sense is that you can't explain the world works unless you understand that there are two voices speaking to every person at all times, and that sometimes we listen to the voice we should not listen to. Jesus reveals to us that this enemy is real and that the battle is in our minds. Now, sometimes Christian collectives or Christian groups have said that you need to empty your mind or non-Christian groups, sects or cults have said to people that you need to empty your mind in order to receive the truth. The Bible never tells you to empty your mind. The Bible never tells you to empty your mind. Instead, the Bible tells you to cultivate your mind. And this text makes clear to us that we are in a battle in our minds And if someone says to you or to me and says, I'd like to go away and be with God, all well and good, but don't forget that if you go away to be with God, you may hear another voice as well. We cannot simply say to one another, well, I went away and I prayed about it and this is what I heard. Because which voice did you hear? What Jesus reveals to us in this story is that we have the potential to hear a different voice other than God. That's the temptation. So this book that Jesus gives to us is the playbook of the enemy. Here's how the enemy will approach you and turn the test into a temptation. So we need to pay attention to it because at stake for Jesus is the existence of the kingdom. At stake for us is whether or not we will participate in that kingdom and live in the reality of his kingdom. So we're in a mental battle. And Jesus gives us to know how the enemy will approach us. He comes to us in this way. The tempter came and said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you are the Son of God. After 40 days in the wilderness, it says that Jesus was famished. That's one of my favorite lines in the Bible. Yeah, 40 days in the wilderness with no food and no water, Jesus was famished, to say the least. He didn't have some superpower to overcome this. He was fully human, God incarnate, but he fully experienced what it meant to be 40 days without food. I know I've missed lunch on occasion, Maybe I worked through lunch or something and it comes to 3.30 and I am incredibly hungry. So I have a little bit of an understanding of what Jesus has gone through here. 40 days in the wilderness and now he's incredibly hungry. He looks around him and he sees stones. And the tempter comes and says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Dale Johnson's incredibly helpful here, and he looks at this line from Satan and draws our attention to four things, four ways in which the tempter is changing this test from God, which is meant to prove and improve our faith to us. Dale Johnson identifies four ways that this attack from the tempter works upon us to erode our faith and our confidence in God. And these four ways are first to focus on the negative, 
Second, to question our relationship with God. Third, to appeal to the real need. And fourth, make something happen. So first, focus on the negative. You're surrounded by stones, Jesus. Don't you see the situation? Look around you in the desert. You're in the wilderness. You have nothing around you but stones, and it's painful and hot. In the world that we live in right now, the voice that tells us of all the things that we're missing out on is incredibly loud, and it comes into our experience in so many different ways. What have you missed out on recently? Did you know about GameStop? Have you been paying attention to Bitcoin? Did you miss out? Do you have the best job that you could have? Do you have a spouse yet? Do you own your own house? Do you have a good job? Do you have a fill in the blank? There are messages that are coming to you that are being spoken. And they are telling you that you are missing out on something. That your life shouldn't be this way. Right now, living in the pandemic, we live in a restricted and limited life, and this is not how it should be. How easy it is for us, even when we have relatively good things, to come home, to look around our home, and not to see the good gifts that we have, but actually to see the things that we don't have. To see that we're surrounded by stones. Yes, we need to pay attention. We need to face negative circumstances. We need to name and know reality. It's good to acknowledge reality, whether that is sickness, loss, or lack in our lives. But Satan wants to, you to make that your focus. He wants you to make that the starting point from which you draw conclusions and deductions. Start from what you do not have. You're surrounded by stones, Jesus. And then the second thing that Daryl identifies is that having paid attention to the stones, what does that say about your relationship with God? Now, Satan here isn't questioning whether or not Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus knows that and lives in that reality. But he's calling into question the quality of the relationship. If you are the Son of God... Why are you out here surrounded by stones? That doesn't sound like a good father-son relationship. You know what it would look like if you were in a good relationship, don't you? A good relationship with your parents, how often would they call you? What would you talk about with them? You know what a good relationship would look like. What father would send you out here? And you've been here long enough, don't you think? 40 days is pretty excessive. I mean, I guess, don't get me wrong here, that might be good parenting these days, but back in my time, that's not how we did things. Has he, has he said anything to you in these 40 days? It's been silent, eh? Hmm. Well, it's not, not for me to say, surely. Um, you know, I just, I'm sorry for you, it's all. It seems like a waste. Have you ever heard that voice? Does it sound at all familiar? We make deductions about God. We make conclusions about God based upon our circumstances, about the nature and character of God. We look around us and we say, because of the way things are for me, this is what I believe and think about God. In Matthew, there's a scripture there where Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. What Jesus reveals to us in this story is that God's Holy Spirit, in order to bring us into deeper relationship with him, in order for us to have that abundant life fully and completely and healthy, the Spirit will actually lead us through wilderness experiences. Because when everything is all right, when all is well in our life, we don't notice that we're relying on false gods. We don't pay attention to the idols in our life. Like Israel, in the deserts of life, 
when we're in the wilderness experience, we see more quickly that we're relying on those false gods. In the desert, we see that they are impotent. In a wilderness experience, you can quickly see how the idols of our world here fail to provide for us in the wilderness. In the wilderness, all we have is God, which means we're exactly where he wants us to be. Satan, on the other hand, says that desert experiences are to be avoided. And if you're ever in one, it means that there's a question around your relationship with God. Living in the midst of a pandemic, we're in a wilderness from our usual ways of living, from our usual ways of relating to one another, of experiencing community, from our usual ways of worshiping to, with one another, or our usual ways even of participating in society at large. What is a child of God doing in a predicament like this? If you're in the desert, perhaps you were deserted, says the voice. Having started from focusing on what we do not have, then questioning our relationship with God, notice that it's an appeal to a real need. The devil tells us, reminds us, draws our attention to a very real need. You need bread. It's perfectly reasonable for human beings to need and to desire bread. You know, Jesus, in order for you to do what you've been called to do, it would not serve well and good for you to die out here in the wilderness. You need bread. Death in the wilderness will not help set the people free. Satan takes a very real need that we have, draws our focus to the negative, starts from there, and then questions the relationship. In so many ways, our lives right now, the voice calling our attention to what we need and what we should have is so very loud. Telling us that we need bread, telling us that we need good homes to live in, telling us that we need sex. Yes, sex is a good gift from God. We need security, we are told. We need so many good things in our life, human flourishing and all that. And we can so easily justify I need that as part of good living. Jesus, you have the power here to turn stones into bread. The need for bread is very real. And as you know, Jesus, with great power comes great responsibility. Besides, it'd probably be just like turning water into wine, you know, to keep the party going. You could do that here. Turn the stones into bread. There are people who need bread. Satan is nothing if not pragmatic. He doesn't tempt us with something overtly evil. It would be easy for us to say, no, thank you. I don't want a part of that. Instead, Satan's temptation comes at us from something incredibly pr pragmatic. And he reminds us that you have the power to do this. You have the power to fulfill this need for yourself or for others. Why don't you make things happen? I don't mean to be disrespectful here, Jesus. Your father, as he claims to be, has not acted yet, has he? Did God not give manna in the wilderness? Didn't he give birds to Elijah in the wilderness? I think you need to take charge here, Jesus. Step out and deal with the problem. Maybe God is the God who helps those who help themselves. Maybe if it's got to be, it's up to me. That could apply here, Jesus, don't you think? If not you, then who? And if not now, then when? Jesus, come on now. Be the man you are called to be. Realize your potential and step up. The pressure that Satan push, pushes here upon us is so very real and so very powerful. And I have seen it. I have seen it in my own life, and I have seen it in the lives of others, and I have seen it in institutions where we sense a very real need, and we step out to fill that need because we sense right now we've got to fix this. Turn these stones into bread, Jesus. 
here is something good, you should do it. And the more you have the ability to get what you want or what you need, the more you have the ability, the power, whether that comes through influence or money, the harder it is to discern whether that voice that's telling you to fill that need is from God or from Satan. I mean, why would you not turn the stones into bread, Jesus? Why would you not help the people? It's important for us to recognize how these four ways that Satan tempts us turns the test into a temptation. It's important to recognize how those four ways can help us to identify that that voice is not the voice of our Father in heaven. First, the voice looks at the negative, draws our attention there, and asks us to make conclusions based on what we lack. And then secondly, based on what we lack, make conclusions about how God is treating us. And I know for myself, I'm not one to kind of say it out loud. Oh God, you know, I don't have that thing that I'm pretty sure that I need. So that means therefore you don't love me. We don't say it out loud. But if we were to journal, to really journal, my sense is that we would write down here, you know, I'm not sure God's got his eye on me right now. Maybe he's busy. I mean, I've seen so many things happening in the news. He's probably looking somewhere else right now. What would it look like if we wrote in our journals what we really thought that God feels about us right now? Satan subtly questions our relationship with God. And he presses in on us with a very real need. Just because it's a real need doesn't mean it's God calling us to solve it or fix it. And then Satan calls us to make something happen, to step out and fix the problem. Take charge. When this voice comes upon us in these four ways, it doesn't feel like freedom. It doesn't feel like freedom in God. It feels like freedom in self, and that can be a false sense of freedom. How do we stand? If we can feel and know that this temptation is in front of us, whether that temptation is for something in our life that we don't have or that we think we should have, and we want to reach out and take it or reach out and participate in it in some way, how do we stand? Jesus responds to Satan, and he says, it is written. It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus, the very word of God, takes his stand, is strengthened by the word of God. Know your scripture. In order to defeat the devil, you need to know your scripture. Now, I don't think what's happening here is that Jesus is always looking for us to find that verse which will solve the problems in front of us. We don't need to be verse quoters. What we need to be is saturated in the book so that we can live out the truth of it and know when the temptation that comes at us is against the word of God. Notice that Jesus doesn't defeat the devil with incantations. And I've seen this in Christianity where there's specific ways that you're supposed to pray to cast out a demon. Notice that Jesus does not simply say, follow some incantation, but instead he turns to the word of God. Incantations, even Christian ones, won't cut it here. It, you need scripture to cut through, the truth of scripture. Jesus's mind is completely filled and saturated with scripture. He's not kind of just looking for, oh, yep, I need verse X to defeat the devil. He's just thinking and living the scripture here. I want to ask us, what is our mind filled with? We can only stand against the temptations of the evil one. If our minds are filled with the words that give life. Now, Jesus here is hungry. He does not deny the very real need for food, for bread. 
But what he's telling us is that there's something more. He reminds us of a scripture that calls to attention that there is something more important, that eating cannot satisfy, that eating and being fed ultimately cannot satisfy the deepest places of our heart and soul. That abundant life is found in hearing and obeying the word of God. That it is more life-giving to us to obey the word of God even when obedience involves physical hunger. Jesus tells us through this text that he will follow the will of God even if it means more days for him without bread. This is a truth in our lives today. Life is so much richer and deeper and more good if we are willing to obey Jesus Christ, if we are willing to obey the will of God, even if it means more days without bread, without whatever it is that we lack. Now, this doesn't mean that suffering is inherently good. We don't, as Christians, go to a homeless person or somebody in need of food and say, don't worry, you don't actually really need those things. What you need is the word of God. This is not saying that people in very real suffering need to simply endure their suffering and instead only have the word of God. That's not what this text is saying. This text is calling us to obedient suffering. We must first meet the basic needs of somebody before they can even hear the word of God. When we live our lives saturated in the word of God, We recognize, as followers of Jesus Christ, that his very words are more important to us than our basic needs, and we will be obedient to his words, even if it means for us more days without bread. That's what Jesus is calling our attention to here. That obedience is better than bread, even if it means more days without bread. He says to us, it is written, And it's worthwhile for us to respond, yes, where is it written? Well, it's written in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And I'd like to read this passage from Deuteronomy in context and hear the good news of God. Hear what this text is calling us to. We all face this temptation in the middle of the test to question our relationship with God. Here now, Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm going to start at verse 2. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The clothes on your back did not wear out, and your feet did not swell these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a parent disciplines a child, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Therefore, keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. God is calling us to abundant life. In order to experience that abundant life in good and healthy relationship with him, obedience is more important than days without bread. Obedience that you can really enjoy this life. Alternatively, if we don't pay attention to the will of God in our lives. The pleasure, the pride, the feeling of success that we get in this life will be empty in comparison with doing the will of God. 
in our season right now that we find ourselves. I read this text from Deuteronomy and I hear the promises of the Lord. And I want us to hear the reality that Jesus points to, that doing the will of the Lord, that being obedient, even if it means more days without bread, will lead us into this abundant life. In your own life, what is it that is pressing in on you? What are you being shown? What are you being told that there are stones around you? Where is some voice speaking to you and saying, look around you, you're just surrounded by stones. What is it for you? Where are you focusing on the negative with the potential to be tempted to question your relationship with God? I encourage you very much, make room in the season of Lent. Identify what lack, what thing missing in your life you're being pulled to focus upon. And acknowledge this. Say, Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, I long for bread. Oh God, I desire a good spouse. Oh God, I need a house. Oh God, I need sex. Oh God, give me a job. What is pressing in on you in your life right now where you're focusing on the negative? And then what's available to us? What does Jesus give us? How does he come alongside us and help us stand? In the face of this temptation, Jesus, the very word of God, is given to us. The written and the living word of God. And in order to stand, we need to saturate our lives with his word. Another way that we can help our bodies to stand, help our minds to stand in this season, when we are tempted, Participate in small fasts. Train yourself. Train yourself to feel a lack and feel it in your body. Identify where in your body you feel that lack. Skip a meal or two. Try to do a short fast. And say to yourself, obedience to God is more important to me than bread. And don't break your fast until God tells you to. Listen to him. Identify how long he wants you to fast and fast for that length. Obedience to God is worth more than a day of bread. That's one way that we can train ourselves. And then there's three things I identified last Sunday that we have that Jesus also had, but not in the same way that we do. We have the spirit just as Jesus did, but we also have his body and his blood. These three things help us to face the tempter, help us to face the temptation that should have been a test to improve and prove our faith. We have the Spirit. So we lean into the Spirit of God when we feel and identify that we are being tempted. We do not defeat the devil. We do not resist him by our own power and might. We don't try to get whatever it is that we need or want. We don't grasp after it. Jesus has given us his spirit. We need to discern his spirit, to rely on his spirit. When the temptation comes within the test, pray for God's spirit to strengthen you and to resist the devil and to do God's will. And then secondly, Jesus has also given us his body to be able to resist temptation. Feed on the body of Christ. Take advantage of the gift that God has given to us in the church, what Paul calls the body of Christ. When temptation comes in tests, call out to your brothers and to your sisters and tell them, here is what I am facing. It even helps just to tell someone else, the devil loves secrecy. When you are facing temptation, tell your brother or your sister, here's what I'm facing. Be accountable to one another. Help me to know the truth. Help me to see the lies that I'm weaving in my own life. 
Find brothers and sisters that you can talk to this about. Receive the body of Christ that God gives to us in order to face the temptation. And then lastly, his blood. When we face temptation in the wilderness, know that you have the blood of Christ. You have the forgiveness of sins that his blood stands for. That the one who has been through this temptation, his blood now covers you. It doesn't mean that we sin all the more, that we justify it because we have his blood. We know and we live in the reality of this world and of the temptation that we face, and we do so as people who are forgiven. There is freedom that comes in facing temptation in the midst of wilderness experiences. And it comes to us from listening to Jesus' journal as he tells us about what the tempter is going to look like and how the tempter is going to speak to us. And we experience freedom as we receive from him his spirit, his body, and his blood so that we too can say, obedience to God is worth more to me than a day without bread. And I would rather be obedient to him even if it means another day without bread. Thanks be to God for this story that he has given us so that we might be strengthened as we go about our days. May his peace be with you. Amen.